And now for a message uh, from our sponsor, the Diabetes Leadership Council. I'd like to introduce Edward Hawthorne, Vice Chair of the Board at Diabetes Leadership Council. Thank you, Bob. I'm Ed Hawthorne, Vice Chair of the Diabetes Leadership Council. The Diabetes Leadership Council unites former leaders of national diabetes organizations to drive policy solutions that improve the lives of people impacted by diabetes. Our leaders come from different states, backgrounds, and professions, but we are all united in our passion for advocacy and our shared commitment to breaking down barriers to effective and affordable and equitable healthcare solutions. I invite you to learn more about the Diabetes Leadership Council after today's webcast by visiting our website at diabetesleadership.org. I'm joined today by another passionate diabetes advocate and longtime friend of the Diabetes Leadership Council, Dr. Jasmine Gonzalo. Dr. Gonzalo is director of the Center for Health Equity and Innovation at Purdue University, a clinical professor of pharmacy practice and a clinical pharmacy specialist. She is immediate past chair of the certification board for diabetes care and education and a current appointee of the National Clinical Care Commission, which is charged with evaluating and making recommendations to Congress and the Secretary of Health and Human Services regarding federal diabetes programs. Welcome, Dr. Gonzalo, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Ed. I'm really happy to be here. Great. Well, today's focus is on diabetes technology, disparities, access, and equity. And we're covering a lot of ground on an important and complex topic. But there are three things we really want the audience to take away from today's conversation. An understanding and appreciation of technologies like continuous glucose monitors and insulin pumps that can positively impact a person's health and prevent or delay some of the costly long-term complications of diabetes. Recognize the importance of sustained, affordable, and individualized access to diabetes technology based on a person's unique needs and circumstances. And open the nation's eyes to the diabetes disparities and inequities that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are experiencing in the U.S. so we can come together constructively to drive meaningful solutions. Now, there are policy challenges that need to be addressed, but also some provider, family, and community-level actions that could help to close the gaps in access and health outcomes. So can you tell us about the Center for Health Equity and Innovation and the interdisciplinary approach that you and your students take to address health disparities in urban and rural communities? Absolutely, Ed, that's a fantastic question. And I, I really like talking about the Center for Health Equity and Innovation. And I would say that the biggest interdisciplinary approach that, that does center around innovation is uh, the collaboration with community health workers. And community health workers are really those people who come from the communities who with, with the biggest disparities and they have lived experience. And so one example that the center has really is um, helping in a clinic which serves people um, experiencing homelessness. And we're partnering with CHWs who have lived experience from those communities with some of the struggles, including mental health disorders or substance abuse issues. And, and having those people connect with the client Intel served by the clinic in order to address those barriers in ways that healthcare providers traditionally have struggled. And so working with community health workers to really um, address the health disparities and improve and optimize outcomes is what um, the center is currently focusing a lot of effort on, as well as the other piece with the social determinants of health and upstream factors. For example, working with high school students on a strategic plan for well-being, both including physical and mental nutritional aspects of um, a high school student's um, lived experience. So those areas, Ed, I think are, are where we, we're spending a lot of our time through the center very early on in our efforts and through the pandemic is, is the social determinants of health and working with community health workers. Now, the center is housed at Purdue School of Pharmacy, correct? Yes, that's correct. So how do community pharmacies fit within the neighborhood context when it comes to addressing diabetes and other health factors in these underserved communities? That's a fantastic question, Ed. And a couple of initiatives that we've had um, really early on with the Center for Health Equity and Innovation is, one, we have partnered with Walgreens to offer flu and COVID vaccinations in partnership with local food banks. And so what we really do with this partnership is bring the vaccines to the communities who need it the most. We're serving about 400 to 500 families per event, and we're able to address the vaccine hesitancy within these populations as well. And so we really bring that trusted rapport that we have with the Walgreens pharmacy pharmacists and technicians and their staff, and we bring it to these communities to really overcome those barriers of mistrust and, and hopefully improve access to, in this case, vaccinations for these food insecure populations. Well, I tell you, it sounds like the collaboration, partnership, and trust 
are huge, 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 huge proof points for you. So absolutely. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, has certainly shed much needed light on health disparities in underserved communities. Now, if there's any, if there are any or any bright spots uh, to be found in the nation's response to COVID-19 pandemic, we see them in innovative endeavors like the food delivery boxes that were sparked by specific community needs. We also saw at a national level how some longstanding barriers to diabetes care could be waived during the public health emergency, making it easier for people with diabetes to continue using their preferred diabetes management tool or obtain new ones to help them manage their diabetes needs during shutdowns, extended quarantines, or hospitalizations. Now, what efforts are you seeing at the national level to reduce barriers to diabetes care and expand access to diabetes technologies? That's a great question, Ed. My time on the National Clinical Care Commission, we really spent a lot of focus on diabetes technologies in particular. And we hope that any day now, and, and hopefully by the end of the year, our recommendations will be published. It just needs to be approved by Congress. And so many of our recommendations relate back to not only the technologies themselves, insulin pump and CGM, access to those technologies, improving access and removing barriers to telehealth, and also the traditional treatments and, and strategies that we see for both diabetes and diabetes prevention. We also spent a lot of our recommendations focused on that as well. So, so kind of the whole the whole gamut, the whole um, approach to diabetes and prediabetes, and really even the upstream factors, we really spent our recommendations focused on um, all of those efforts in terms of removing barriers and, and improving um, and optimizing outcomes. And well, one thing that we know for sure is that the problem is complex and the solutions are not simple. So, so clearly there are many contributing factors to diabetes disparities, but there are also a lot of stakeholders who are committing positive change. Uh, the Diabetes Leadership Council serves as a convener and a connector both within the diabetes community and beyond it. And we work with a number of other national diabetes organizations, as well as policymakers and staff, research organizations, academic, healthcare professionals, manufacturers, and system stakeholders. We find that convening these parties helps us all to better understand the complex issues, uh, and while leveraging each other's strengths rather than duplicating efforts or missing opportunities. For example, uh, this past year, uh, DLC became the first patient advocacy member uh, to the Diabetes Technology Access Coalition. Several national diabetes patient advocacy organizations, philanthropic organizations, device manufacturers, and leading clinicians have come together as DTAC to provide to improve access to diabetes management tools. The coalition is following on is, fo is focusing now on improving technology access and equity for Medicare beneficiaries by modernizing and simplifying coverage criteria. CMS has started taking steps in the right direction, but more changes are needed. And as you know, Medicare often sets the standards for other payers, correct? Yes, absolutely. And early and sustained access to diabetes technology is now embodied in clinical guidelines from the American Diabetes Association, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and the Endocrine Society. There's a rich body of evidence supporting access to these tools to help manage blood sugar levels or warn against dangerous highs and lows. These tools can help prevent complications um, for people with diabetes that people with diabetes experience on a day-to-day -day basis that can contribute to even costlier and sometimes devastating complications over time. And, and finally, we, we turn before we turn the mic back over to Bob uh, in the Hill studio, we should address the cost of diabetes technologies. Uh, can the nation afford to invest in broader and more equitable access to diabetes tech? Absolutely. So between Medicare, Medicaid, the military, public payers cover 67% of the nation's diabetes costs. And unfortunately, 60% of overall diabetes spending treats complications rather than diabetes management or, or prevention. It would make much more sense from a clinical and public finance perspective to get the right tools in the hands of people who need them and then train them to use them effectively rather than paying for complications and disabilities in later years. You know, and usually when I'm talking about what what I do in a clinic setting, sometimes I say that I'm, I feel like I'm putting fires out, right? You know, people are coming to clinic and A1Cs of 10 and, and there, there's such an opportunity to do so much more work earlier versus treating the complications. And so um, focusing our efforts um, more on the front end and preventing a lot of um, the damage that's done leading up to these complications is really where, where we stand to make a lot of improvement. Yeah, it is also important to note uh, for our audience that costs for diabetes technology and related supplies can be prohibited for uninsured or underinsured people with diabetes. But help is available, whether it is at a community health center or through the state's or manufacturer's assistance programs. 
but viewers can find links to those resources uh, on our website at diabetesleadership.org. So thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank Dexcom and Lilly Diabetes for making it possible for DLC to sponsor today's event. Their grant support helped underwrite the cost to sponsor this program, but the DLC worked exclusively with The Hill on its content. So now I'll turn it back over to Bob in The Hill Studios.